Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's discussion with President Eric Barron. These ongoing webinars focus on answering questions about the university's continued response to the pandemic and other related critical topics. Joining Dr. Barron today are Dr. Kara Exton, Assistant Professor of Nursing, Dr. Matt Ferrari, Associate Professor of Biology, and Dr. Andrew Reed, Evan Pugh Professor of Biology and Entomology, Everly Professor of Biotechnology, and Director of the Huck Institutes of the Life Sciences. Our faculty panel will be moderated by Dr. Barron. Today's panel will discuss community, trends, data that university leaders consider as they make operating testing and mitigation decisions. Now, many of you shared questions with us in advance, which we've condensed ahead of time in order to answer as many as possible. We're doing things a little bit differently today as we've grouped the questions together so that our panel could address specific topical areas during this webinar. Now, if you have a question during our time, please submit it using the Q&A tool in the Zoom webinar. Along with your question, please include your name, academic unit, and campus location. And if time allows, the panel will look to address those questions. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Barron. Well, thank you all for joining uh, me today, joining us today. I do want to provide a brief update. The university has publicized its plan for the November 20th departure of students and the transition to remote learning. Uh, that was publicized earlier this week. To support faculty members, Penn State will be holding a remote symposium to help instructors prepare for the transition to remote learning. Uh, this remote symposium will take place from 10 a.m. to 2.45 p.m. on Friday, November 6th. Today, we will be addressing a number of important topics, including prevalence rates, spread, factors in decision-making, declining cases at University Park or flattening cases at University Park. I'm going to always caution everyone that there, there's, you know, we have a history in the U.S. of having time periods of going up and other time periods of going, going down. Um, so, you know, each week we wait for carefully um, in terms of what our our numbers are like. We're also going to look at testing strategy, general questions about the coronavirus. Um, we have a few of our faculty experts, as you heard, joining me to help answer these questions. But I do want to take a moment to acknowledge all of the researchers across the Commonwealth uh, that are working together, um, studying the virus, developing vaccines, working on preparedness, and a wide range of other efforts. Uh, thank you for all of your work. And let's just go ahead and dive into, um, dive into the questions that you have provided. So first, our topics related to the prevalence rates. We have a number of questions about prevalence, how to interpret them, how prevalence factors uh, into our decision-making, um, We've seen what appears to be a, a decline on our campuses or a flattening and at institutions across the country. Uh, could this mean that our mitigation efforts are, are showing resu results? And again, we may turn around and, and, and have a growth and, and then a decline. So um, let me just begin uh, uh, in, in just saying that, that um, our our mitigation decisions are based, as I've said um, many times, on multiple pieces of data. And prevalence rates are just one of those factors. But let's dig into prevalence rates a little bit. Matt, can you talk about the different prevalence rates between our on-demand and random testing and how they differ and, and why they differ? Yeah, sure. Uh, so thanks, everybody. And, and, and actually, first, I want to start with um, Prevalence, the actual definition of prevalence, is the, the proportion of the population that is currently infected. So there's really only one prevalence rate that's out there. It's, how, it's, the, it's the, the number or the fraction of, of our university population that is currently infected. The different rates that many people are seeing and are, and are, seeing and are concerned about is the positivity rate. That's what fraction of people that come in and get tested are testing positive or testing negative. And that's going to be quite different based on who's, be, who's being seen in each of these settings. So in our on-demand and our university health services testing, that's where folks go when they already have symptoms or they recently have been contacts of somebody with symptoms. And so those, those are individuals that are more likely to be positive, right? And so it's our expectation 
that those in that, that the positivity rate should be higher there. Our uh, surveil our random screening or surveillance testing, those are individuals that are getting randomly pulled out of a pull, their names are being pulled out of a hat and they're being asked to come in and get tested, whether uh, not the, they're being chosen whether they're symptomatic or not. And then we're actually screening them out if they're already symptomatic and asking them to go to UHS to get tested. So these are individuals that are in fact quite unlikely to be positive. And so the corresponding number is much, much lower. Because that's a, ran that's a random selection, that's actually a little bit more representative of what we think the proportion in the overall population is. It has a little bit of bias because we screen some of these individuals out, out that, are, that are either symptomatic or, um, or contacts, but we can do some back correction. And that's what we actually do internally is to uh, look at the raw prevalence rate that we get from our surveillance testing, which is a relatively low number, right? And then we do some correction to look at how many individuals were that were chosen out of the hat were symptomatic and how many of them do we expect uh, then to have been positive. And then we can correct that to get an overall estimate of the prevalence rate, the proportion of our university community that we think is truly positive. And, and we've had a, one question that is along these lines and it says, according to the dashboard, Penn State's positivity rate hovers at about 18%. Um, could, could you just explain that number? And is, this, is there reason for alarm um, with an 18% positivity rate? I, I, think, I think that's probably not the right rate. Right. Again, the the um, so that's definitely not the probability that some that any randomly chosen individual on campus is positive, right? That's the that's the that's the probability that someone that goes and seeks testing at University Health Services or at our at one of our walk up sites. That's the probability that those individuals are positive, and that's actually a much much higher probability because these are individuals that are already symptomatic or are already known to be in contact with other ind with, with individuals that are positive, right? So that's actually a really small subset of our campus. We're, again, what we're seeing through our surveillance testing is that of the people that we pull out of the hat, right? Uh, and about 1% about or less of those individuals actually turn out to be positive, right? So the vast majority of our population is, uh, uh, is, is, um, is unlikely to be positive. And it's really the folks that are sort of in line at UHS that have a higher probability. And what we're doing, is, again, as I said, is, is combining those, those two pieces of information um, to, to get an overall look at the, at the prevalence and the trend in prevalence um, uh, across the campus. And if, if you'd like, I'd be happy to show a, show a picture of what that really looks like. Oh, that'd be great. Sure. So let me just switch over. Um, and, uh, and share my screen so we can see this, right? So what we've done here is tracking over time from September to the middle of October now, what our estimated or inferred COVID prevalence is. And there's two kinds of points on here. There's the red dots under uh, at, the, at the low end. And th that's, the, that's the proportion of, of students that are tested through our random screening that, are, that turn up positive, right? Um, and so it's, that's hard to read the, it's hard to read the axis. Could you say what a number is like for October? Sure. 15? Yes. Yeah. So this is, this is ranging between zero and 5%, right? So this is a pro proportion of the population, zero, 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, 5%, right? And so at the beginning of, semest of the semester, that started off quite high, right? But it's dropped and has stayed relatively stable at 1% or less of the students that are tested through the surveillance site that turn up positive, okay? But as I said, we know that we screen out some individuals uh, that, are, that, are, that might be symptomatic or recent contacts, and we expect them to be positive at a slightly higher rate, right? And we know that because we're tracking those trends through UHS. And so what we do is we actually correct those numbers, right? And we infer how many of them we expect to be positive based on all the other trends that we're seeing across campus. Right, so we end up with an inferred proportion of the student population that's positive after we account for the various biases that we know are probably going on in our sampling strategy. And so when we look at that, we still see the same overall trend, but, um, but the, in, the inferred prevalence is a little bit higher. It's closer to two to two and a half percent, but it's been staying relatively stable there uh, for the last several weeks. 
And so this is a little bit closer to what we think the probability that any randomly chosen student might be positive. This is again on the order of two to two and a half percent rather than 18 to 20. That's a, a extremely useful. I mean, I do think that that um, that because we have two different purposes. One is if you're symptomatic, we want to pull you out of, out of the population, and and we want to if you've had close contact, make sure that uh, make sure that you're safe. Versus this notion of of surveillance, and so uh, having having a a positivity a rate or an inferred one that's that's ordered uh, two to three percent, of course, very different than than 18. Thank you for that very clear ex explanation. Well, we've also had some questions about the spread of coronavirus and how it looks on our campuses. So it would be nice to spend a little bit of time specifically looking at that. Um, you know, again, we're looking at multiple pieces of information to understand how the disease uh, could spread and and also how it is spreading nationwide. Now, at, at this point, to my knowledge, uh, we have not seen indications that there has been a significant level of spread outside the Penn State community or even from students to faculty and, and staff. Um, Kara, could you talk a little bit about our surveillance testing and how it helps us look at the, the spread of disease in our, our campus and communities? Absolutely. So Matt just gave a really great overview of our surveillance testing program. And as most of the people watching know, our surveillance testing program consists of testing a random 1% of students and employees every day at the University Park campus and the Commonwealth campuses. And what we're seeing is that there's a really steady prevalence among students, and we really aren't seeing um, major increases in that rate, which helps us to know that we have, we have a good understanding of the prevalence among students. What's been really important for us and something that we've evaluated really closely is the um, surveillance testing um, results among employees because we were very concerned to make making sure that our employees were safe. And what we're seeing is extremely low prevalence among employees. And um, that indicates to us that there's very little spread passing from students to employees. And so we have been um, you know, really assured by that data. But as you mentioned, we're really looking at a lot of data and we're, in order to think about the spread to communities, we're tracking um, that spread in numerous ways. So we're monitoring disease rates using various other data streams, including Department of Health data in Center County and in surrounding counties. We're monitoring data from community health providers like Mount Nittany Medical Center, urgent care centers. And so we're trying to get an overall picture of what disease rates are both on the campus and around the campus to, so that we can um, really have an understanding of how the disease may be spreading. Thanks, I, I, I appreciate that. So we, we can give credit for the students for uh, masking and social distancing and also give fact, give give thanks to our, our uh, faculty and, and, and staff for must be doing the same thing if, if that spread is, is very low. Thank you for, for that explanation. Well, beyond surveillance testing, um, both Matt and Andrew uh, are leading projects that help us get a sense of community spread and, and even, even early warning. Maybe you could begin, Matt, by talking about what is data for action? Sure, yeah, so uh, this has been a really exciting initiative and, um, and this has actually come together both through a collaboration from the Huck Institutes led by Dr. Reed um, and Susan McHale at the, um, at the SSRI, the Social Science Research Institute, as well as our uh, uh, Clinical and Translational Research Institute. Um, and this has brought together a, a, a bunch of research across the campus to study both the biological impacts of COVID in our community. So that's um, how much virus is out there, how many uh, testing individuals for antibody prevalence to see who's been exposed in the past, but also to look at um, the social, economic, and cultural impacts. Um, how are people handling the stress of, of, uh, of mitigation efforts? What are the economic consequences for our community? Um, and uh, we've completed over the course of September um, over 10,000 surveys of Center County residents, which gives us quite a good look at what the, the social and economic impacts have been, 
but we've also taken blood from almost 1500 uh, Center County residents and tested those for antibodies. And what that tells us is how many of those individuals have been exposed to COVID prior to the, the point of sampling, right? So they don't have to be actively infected at that, at that point, but it gives us an indication of whether they've ever been exposed to this. And what we've seen is, um, is a really stark picture, right? Almost everybody says that COVID has impacted their lives, right? Either uh, by restricting their interactions with other people in the community or, or affecting their employment or something like that, right? But only about 2% of county residents had antibodies through the, through the end of September, indicating that they had been exposed to COVID, right? So again, I think at this point, we're optimistic that this illustrates um, the, the, the protective impact of, of all of our mitigation efforts, um, that, this, that this is not, um, that, that, that all of our activities have minimized the spread of COVID out into the community. And we've even looked across from the beginning of September to the end of September, right? At the beginning of the September, the students had just arrived. We had, we had some but not large numbers of cases in the community. But even from the beginning of September to the end of September, we didn't see any change in the, the rate of, of community members that were positive with antibodies. So this is again, um, encouraging to us. Uh, we're not gonna take this line down though, and we're gonna keep going forward and we're actually gonna uh, bring these individuals back in uh, in November and, and test them again and, and continue to monitor what, this, what the spread is in, in our communities and identify um, again, what kinds of behaviors and mitigation efforts might be effective in, in, uh, in protecting people overall. Um, thank you. And, and Andrew, you have been taking this a little bit further, uh, a different type of data set uh, focused on wastewater. Maybe you could tell people why sample wastewater and then what, what you're learning. Yeah, sure. Um, as many of you know, although um, uh, the virus is a respiratory virus, uh, it was discovered very early on that people shed uh, virus in their feces. And so we've been uh, monitoring uh, wastewater in town and on campus. Um, the aim of the game is to try to provide another data stream, one of these layers, uh, to monitor what's going on. So complement the, um, the human testing. And uh, we can do, of course, the wastewater without sampling people at all. And then uh, the other part of it is whether or not we can locate where on campus or where in town cases are. And so direct mitigation in that direction. And if it's, if it's okay, I'll... Um, show the, the data. This is a, um, a project that has been uh, led by uh, me and Tom Richards from the IEE, but there's a number of faculty and, and folk and staff involved in this project, including uh, wastewater engineers. I've learned more about University Park plumbing than I ever imagined. This is the wastewater plant at University Park. This is the, uh, the catchment that's the University Joint Area Authority catchment. So all of the wastewater from the area in green and the uh, Pine Grove Mills area goes into the plant, the wastewater plant. And then the circle in the middle is University Park, which has its own plant. And so we're collecting from the township. We're collecting from the University Park. That's this cam the campus here. We also have a, a downtown catchment. That's this one here. So this is college running up here. So this is the area that includes the fraternities, uh, Beaver Canyon, that sort of area. And then on campus itself, we have three catchments. We've got one in the East Halls, West Halls, and bits of Pollock and South Halls. And so we're collecting wastewater um, from each of those catchments. And we've been doing that daily since uh, the beginning of semester, actually in some cases, uh, since the beginning of uh, July. This is the time series for the Penn State plant. So this is the wastewater draining off the University Park campus. And this is the wastewater that's in the municipality. So that's everything around the campus. And the y-axis here is virus uh, concentrations through time. And then uh, you can see the, these are the measurements and various types of model fits, which I don't have time to go through. You can see that when semester started, we that's when we first started seeing virus on campus. And then there's been quite the growth through uh, early and mid-September. And then since September, uh, middle of September, things have been declining pretty steadily, both at the um, University Park campus and particularly in town. Um, in the last week or two, it looks like things have stabilized more. It's not continued to decline. And this uh, jump here 
uh, does look like a movement upwards. So this one we just got yesterday is down again, but I just literally five minutes ago got the results in for today and that's a little bit higher again. So this needs to be watched. It looks like something's going on at the moment and the municipality and town, things have really stabilized. The downward decline um, has stopped. These are the individual catchments. So this is the downtown catchment, the one that includes the fraternities, Beaver Canyon and so forth. And we started sampling that in the middle of September and it's been steadily declining ever since. So less and less virus in the wastewater there. East Halls has had a fair bit of activity. You can see this is the main campus jump in the early September part. And then right now it's doing a bit of bouncing around as well. And so this needs to be carefully watched at the moment. But you can see that in the last few weeks, second half of September and, and um, first part of October, things really declined. And then this catchment here is the one that's draining off parts of Pollock and South Halls and is apart from a jump back here, has been really very calm since then. Um, of course, we want to know, does this relate to actual cases? So the blue here is the, the jotted line, jagged line is the cases through time reported to the Department of Health. And the red jagged line is our data, the wastewater data. And then this is the smooth uh, curve for the wastewater and for the cases. And so, you know, it looks like we're getting maybe a 10 day head start on what the trends are. And this is this flattening and perhaps rising that we're getting um, now. And um, just to give you a sense of where we're planning to go, at the moment we've been doing proof of concept work, but the plan going forward is to get the entire campus um, saturated with samplers and so forth. So the each individual catchment here, we can figure out what's coming out of it. And then if one, there's positivity in one of these catchments, go in and find it in, in the, in the, in the uh, other areas within those catchments. Uh, we've got plans to roll this out across the entire Commonwealth. In principle, that would be relatively straightforward to do. Um, and then uh, we are uh, very much interested in some of the drugs that are being used to treat patients. Those too can be measured in this wastewater. So I think overall, the, the trends in the last few weeks have been pretty promising. Uh, we need to keep an eye on what's going on at the moment. Just to give you a sense of this, this gives us eyes on what's happening in town. And we have until recently been seeing um, that roughly um, half of the virus that's in town, the town wastewater supply has been coming from that downtown area. And that's now dropped in the last few weeks down to 10%. So we can get eyes on the students that are living in town and the eyes on the students in, on campus. And we also think we would get uh, about to pick up community transmission between non-student residents in the center county area if, if that happens. So th thank you, Andrew. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm uh, struck by um, by the number of layers that are involved in, in what's going on with surveillance testing and on-demand testing and pop-up testing and, and the, the, uh, the, the data for action that is, is looking at the community wastewater here that's uh, examining difference by, by catchment areas. And, but a lot of this is very new. May, maybe you would give us some sense of the types of, of things that that you view as limitations or that you would like to, uh, to, to look at more deeply um, uh, with, with these data sets? Yeah, well, let me start with the wastewater. This is very new technology. So what, uh, people have been sampling wastewater for polio virus for many years. It's also an RNA virus. Um, but we don't know a lot about what it means when you have a virus being shed, which is a principally a respiratory virus, not a gastrointestinal virus. And so one of our big unknowns is for our population, how much does pe do people shed and what sort of timelines do they shed over? Do they shed for a long time after they became infected? Do they shed early on? We don't know that for these sorts of people. We, it's known for severe cases in hospitals, but not for this. So that's a big unknown. And so that's one of our big tasks is to relate the concentrations we see to the uh, number of, of people involved. I think we also don't really know at the moment how to, what these numbers numerically actually mean. So when we, we are still learning what's a big jump and what's a small jump, and that is taking um, some time uh, to, to figure out. Um, but I do think we're getting better and better at it. And we've of course got these other data streams that you're talking about coming on uh, that we can look at as sanity checks, the other cases, what's coming up in the asymptomatics and so forth. So there's a lot of mutual analysis going on here to try to confirm this. But yeah, I definitely want to give you the sense here. We are um, not only trying to build this plane while we're flying it, but also trying to design it. So this is very, very new combination of research uh, and surveillance all happening at the same time.
exciting, but uh, it means there's uncertainties. It, it is definitely fascinating uh, and, and, and instructive, clearly instructive. Matt, do you have anything to add that you'd like to add there? Um, well, I, I guess I'd, I'd say one of the other really big unknowns and, and, and uh, something that is really going to impact uh, policies and mitigation efforts going forward is uh, how long people mount an immune response to this particular virus, right? I mean, this uh, understanding the body's response to this and how, and how long and how strong the protective antibody response to infection might be is going to have a real big uh, effect on what we expect the risks to be going into the spring term and in the summer and, and into next fall. Uh, and so uh, the project that we, the, the data for action project, this, this is one of the, the, the uh, guiding questions here is our ability to track individuals through time and look at their antibody levels over time. And we're doing this both with community re residents and we're starting with, uh, with students next week and over the, ne the next coming weeks. And then we're gonna sample them again and again and again. And that's gonna help us to understand how long their body mounts an immune response and how long we might, like, we, we might expect to have protective immunity to this virus. Thanks, thanks. There are a number of other questions uh, that, that focus on decision-making and, and in particular, you know, what factors we consider in our mitigation uh, decisions. And I've, I've uh, answered many times in, in terms of, of the factors that we have from uh, hospitalization, community spread, what, what the numbers are, what are quarantine and isolation spaces, a whole, a whole group of these that, that then lead us to, uh, as administrators, to um, decisions about uh, off ramps or, or on ramps, depending on, on what looks like. Um, we also have a lot of specific questions in this. So one is, how would you respond to a specific spike in, in a building uh, on a campus and whether that would cause us to shift to remote learning? Well, so it, it really <laughs> depends on a lot of factors because we're going to look at at many, not just a, a single one, but if it were a floor of a building or a building, we're much more likely to take um, a more limited action than, than having an entire campus to go to remote. Uh, so for example, we could focus on a particular building uh, in, in terms of the folks that, that occupy that, that uh, building, in terms of, of having a quarantine period that we might look at for that uh, particular building. We, are likely to do pop-up testing so that we can get a deeper understanding beyond the testing that we're doing already. And we're also likely to take a lot of actions in terms of, of cleaning the buildings and, and other specifics that will depend on the specific circumstances that we have. Well, you know, so that's one thing that is sort of operational, but, um, you know, Matt, in, in terms of decision-making, um, is, is there a data points or, or trends that, that uh, should draw more attention from, uh, from our leaders and experts than, than other information? And maybe you could just talk about how an epidemiologist would see uh, these factors in terms of, of, of viral spread and, and even how you would determine if there is viral spread in a community. Sure. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the truth is, yeah, even, even for a trained epidemiologist and all the trained epidemiologists that I know, um, there, there rarely is a single number, right? We really do need to take these things into context. And, and, and the, the numbers are highly dependent on the populations that we're, that we're concerned about. Um, uh, one of the things that, we, that, we've, uh, that we've tended to look at, both across um, the, the county, the state and county level numbers, as well as through our Penn State numbers, has been uh, to try and assess how diffuse or how localized infection is. So long, you know, so, so numbers that are well focused and we can identify a likely source or a likely target of action, right? Those are numbers that are at least actionable and they can drive uh, certain kinds of activities, right? So again, as you, as you identified, if we thought we had um, specific, uh, uh, a specific building that had a relatively large number of, of, of infected individuals in it, that's something that we could take a specific targeted action, uh, action for. Um, so oftentimes we're looking at sort of 
how coherent, how, how tractable are these numbers, right? So when we've been looking at the county numbers around, uh, around uh, Center County, we've started to see increases in, in those areas, right? But one of the things that we've noticed through then investigation and through talking through with uh, the regional healthcare providers is that those have been um, uh, tend, tend to be localized in specific long-term care facilities. So it's really unfortunate that, that uh, infection has gotten into those facilities, but because we know that, that, that those are the specific foci of infection, then we can target specific resources to try and trying to stop the spread there. And we would get a very different picture if we were seeing numbers increase, but, but, it, but couldn't specifically localize it to an area where we could take explicit action. Right? So again, very much what we're looking at is, look, is, is trying to put those numbers into context and identify whether or not that context can lead to a specific action or a specific consequence that can be taken. Thanks. Um, one other question to direct to you, Matt, is a question about hospital capacity and decision making. And at the beginning of the year, the metric of hospital admissions was used as an example of something that would trigger a switch uh, to remote learning coupled with a group of other things. And last week, I think we saw Mount Nittany reported 17 hospitalizations. I think yesterday the total was, was 13. They've gone into surge mode, which, which means that some elective surgeries they're not doing and, and, and they're, they're ready uh, to have uh, additional cases if, if they uh, occur. Um, so one question here is, is, um, is what happens, what should the university be doing uh, as a plan to, to response? Now, from my viewpoint, um, we're meeting with the hospital every week and the hospital leadership every week, and we're working hard to understand, um, to understand what's going on, information that you just presented, uh, learn about hospital capacity and do everything we can uh, to collaborate with them so uh, uh, as true partners. But um, that aside, the, the notion of the university in close partnership with hospitals to make sure we understand and can, and can be helpful and make joint decisions, how maybe you could talk about how hospital capacity figures, uh, figures into into the decisions and your thoughts about about um, about COVID. Yeah, so I think this again is is um, you know in every given setting we need to look at, at what the specific local context is. And so uh, uh, for Penn for Penn State and for University Park in particular, right? Um, we actually have a comparatively small hospital relative to our population. And this isn't necessarily the case at many of the other Commonwealth campuses. Right. So this so so hospital capacity and the capacity of Mount Nittany um, uh, Mount Nittany has been um, a specific area of focus and a specific area of concern for us uh, locally here at University Park. And so early on in our in the in the planning, we we put a specific focus on this, and we made really conservative decisions and really conservative assumptions about what we thought hospital capacity would be like at. Mount, at Mount Nittany. And, and in fact, the assumptions we were making what, was that each individual that went into the hospital would have a, a three-week stay, right? So, the, so, we, so we assumed that, that the people would come in and would spend a relatively long period of time. And that meant that the absolute number of people the hospital could handle was comparatively low. Um, one of the... Um, uh, one of the things that have sort of fallen in our favor, I suppose, uh, is that uh, the the length of hospital stays that we've seen through the through Mount Nittany, and, and again, this comes from continual engagement and continual discussion with, with Mount Nittany to, to keep the flow of information moving, is that on average, people have been spending much, much shorter stays. Many people are staying only a couple of days. I think the average length of stay has been about five days, right? So that means that while there, there's a fixed number of beds, um, people are coming in and then moving out, and those beds are, become, are, are freeing up, and, and, and the hospital still has uh, some, some, uh, some ability to, to, to take on new patients, right? So it actually means that we made overly conservative assumptions about what we thought the, the, the hospital could manage. Um, and again, that was us making decisions several months ago when the standard of care for COVID was, uh, was still not very well developed, 
and, and uh, clinicians have been developing new, uh, new therapies, um, uh, learning and understanding the, the course of COVID disease um, as, as time goes on and doing a much better job then of managing, managing patients uh, and, and, um, and preventing their, their symptoms from progressing to, to severe levels. So um, I still think that in our community, the, um, that the hospital capacity is um, uh, a major focal point for us. And I think it's something that we do need to be quite concerned about. Um, I, I, I'm concerned about the numbers that we have now, but I also look at them in the context of our overall numbers of cases that we're seeing campus-wide, which have been declining, our overall number of cases that we've been seeing uh, county-wide, which have been declining, right? So it seems that um, while the, the hospital numbers are high currently, um, I think we can hopefully anticipate that, that the rate of admissions coming in might start to slow down. Um, if indeed we're seeing uh, an overall slowdown or stabilization uh, at the county level, which is what the what the incidence data seems to be suggesting at the moment. So in general, um, nationally, when the number of, of positives starts to decline, uh, some, some time later, the hospitalization starts to decline too. This is a, a fairly common correlation nationally. Is that true? Yeah, that's true, and it's it's a little bit decoupled. So you so hospital hospitalizations tend to lag cases a little bit. So we sort of go into a phase where cases have been going up, plateau, and decline, and hospitalizations may actually continue to increase behind that because these are individuals that were infected several weeks ago whose disease is progressing to the point where they need to be hospitalized. So I think there's, I mean, I, I'm not naive to the fact that, that we may still see some, some increased hospital admissions over the, over the coming days or week, and we're monitoring that quite closely. Um, but we're hopeful that, um, that the, the national trends that we've seen uh, will, will, will manifest here and we'll start to see at least a slowdown in the number of people that are, that are admitted on a daily basis. Thanks, thanks. We also have a question about uh, starting classes in the spring, and the question specifically is, have you considered starting the semester remotely and bringing students back to campus in mid-February to limit the number of bad weather indoor weeks they, they are, are here? Um, and so that's one that, that, that I can take, and we have looked at a lot of different options for the spring semester. And ultimately, we, we chose an option. Uh, we chose the option because of educational outcomes, what we thought was best for faculty and, and, and students, and the importance of minimizing travel, uh, making sure that we have the right testing, contact tracing, and quarantine and isolation space, among many other factors. Um, like many universities across the country, we have canceled spring break. Uh, to limit limit travel, and and we started classes later uh, to help us uh, avoid a, a week of of peak flu season, and also to separate our our testing uh, um, f uh, away from um, away from the holidays, and and so a lot of thought went into this as the best way to do this, and um, so I I I believe we have a a, a good model. Um, the next topic is, is declining cases at Penn State. Uh, we've received a, a number of questions about the declining number of positive test results among University Park students over the last few weeks. Um, so we could spend a little bit more time discussing that. And, and again, and I'm, I'm adding caution here. I'm cautiously optimistic because it appears to flatten. And every time something happens, like as Xander Reed suggested, with a, a, a little bump in, in one of the catchment areas, I, I think we just have to be realistic that, that numbers do go up and down. Um, but um, we have seen a, flat, a decline and a flattening, still a little bit of uh, variability. Other universities have, have seen uh, the, the, um, something similar. Um, it is interesting that we've also, in that context, heard concerns that perhaps some students are gaming the system. They're, they're opting out of the university testing. Maybe they're um, going someplace else because they, they don't want to isolate. Um, th this, uh, this can happen, uh, but, um, 
but generally from a lot of different analysis, it, it, it doesn't appear that that, that answers uh, the, the decline and flattening that, that we have seen in, uh, in, in total. Um, we're in contact with a lot of other uh, uh, testing groups, including MedExpress and Department of Health to make sure that we're not missing something. We've even done analysis of surrounding stu uh, counties and looking at the age groups tested to make sure that we're not um, uh, missing anything. We are seeing fewer students coming into US um, University Health Services for symptomatic testing. Uh, hopefully that's a positive uh, uh, story that's there. But uh, Cara, can you talk to us about the recent downward trend in surveillance testing results and, and how we should interpret it and uh, anything you can say about the concerns that students might be gaming the system? Sure, so you, you've touched on a lot of the most important points. And you know, like you said, we, we're cautiously optimistic about the declines we've seen and what we know, but we are fairly confident that the prevalence rate is holding constant. And Matt shared some analyses earlier where we correct for some of the opt-outs that we allow for so that we are, and we are, confident that we're seeing a holding pattern in the prevalence we're seeing. Um, we are seeing some declines in many of our testing streams um, and we are really cautiously optimistic but also investigating them. So I would say we are sort of approaching this in two different ways. One of them is we're really closely monitoring a lot of the data from other areas, to, as you said, to make sure we're not seeing uh, increase of 18 to 24 year olds getting tested at these other sites that might be college students trying to um, skip out of the Penn State system. So we're monitoring really closely, um, but, and we're also mitigating. So we're trying to fix the things we can. We know we are aware of the reports that students gain the system. We're also aware of the data um, on this age group and you know, typical behavior among this age group is to gain some systems. And so we're working closely to try to mitigate any way that they might be able to do that. So we're correcting, we're um, altering some of our procedures and our protocols. We're trying to minimize, disincentivize gaming the system, for example. So um, while we still will always allow people to opt out for being symptomatic for surveillance, which we'll touch on a little bit more in detail later, but we're making it that people are gonna be selected back in if they do that. So um, we want you to opt out if you're symptomatic, we want you to take care of yourself, but we want you to then come back and get tested in the surveillance system. So we are trying to disincentivize any ways that people might be gaming the system as an effort to um, make sure that our um, estimates of prevalence are as accurate as possible. So I, I have to admit, Akar, that I'm, I still worry an awful lot. And uh, so it would, it would be easy to sit there and say, oh, okay, look, this looks pretty good. It, it declined and it's flattened and there might be some variability in there, but it's flattened um, and the prevalence rate uh, that they're corrected for, for the opt out part of it, 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 it is fairly flat. But I have this worry that um, with good news comes people that relax and no longer social distance or wear their masks. So, um, so is it entirely appropriate to say uh, this isn't a time to be cheering? This is a time to still uh, buckle down and pay attention to all these rules uh, because it, it might be flat uh, today, but it could change rather quickly if people change their behavior? Absolutely. You know, if we are seeing a decline in cases, if this decline holds constant, and if, you know, this ends up um, holding, then it's because we've done something right. And we are, we want to encourage good behavior to continue. We want to continue to mask up. We want to continue to stay in small pods of socialization. We want to continue to social distance, spend more time outdoors than indoors. All of the things that we know reduce our risk of COVID those things are working and we do believe they're working. Um, and so we do want to continue to um, encourage that behavior. And Matt has a fantastic analogy that is really tempting for me to steal right now, but I'm going to let him have his moment with his football uh, analogy. So I don't want to steal it. <laughs> wait, that's, I, I really, I really got called out on this and, and this is, this is, this is, I, 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 I don't know. 
I, I really want to apologize to the entire audience because uh, because anyone here that knows me knows that I really know almost nothing about football. Um, but nonetheless, I think I, I do live close enough to the stadium that I that I hear the fans cheering, and I I know absolutely the Penn Staters do not stop do not stop cheering when you're up by one and you go in at halftime, right? We cheer through to the to the end of the game, and I think that's what we really need to be looking at here is that. The goal is for the goal was for us to get cases down and to get things down to stable levels, and now we need to keep doing everything that we're doing to maintain that uh, for the for the next uh, month and a half until we reach the end of the semester, so that we can get everybody through the things they need to get through. But then again, planning into the planning into the spring and planning into the summer, and and so that we can really uh, focus our activities and prioritize to the things that are most important to us. Um, and and you know and 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 accept and and deal with the little hassles that we're going to have to that we're going to have to live with uh, to keep everybody safe. Thanks, thanks. It's not a bad analogy. So uh, another set of uh, uh, another set of questions involve testing strategy and uh, people asking about how we arrived at our strategy and whether we have planned to adjust it heading into November twentieth a departure of our students and the start of the spring semester. So uh, I'm just gonna uh, address for a minute the, the uh, as we head into November 20th. So the key here is we certainly do not want any students who may be infected but asymptomatic to leave campus and take COVID-19 home with them to family members or others that may be at, at higher risk. So we announced a plan this, this week to make on-demand testing available for any student who wishes to be tested prior to uh, leaving our campuses for Thanksgiving break. Uh, we're encouraging this. It's free on-demand testing. Uh, we're encouraging it both for uh, their own health and, and that of others. Um, and frankly, it will also help us gather more information about the disease. We also have a question about pre-arrival testing in the spring. And the specific question is, will you be testing 100% of the students returning in, in January? And, and if not, why not? And so, of course, we have announced we will be doing pre-arrival testing. We're still working on the best way. Um, you know, the best way for me to say it is that we have seen uh, testing capacity and capability to change dramatically over the last few months. So what might have been impossible in, in July uh, uh, can become possible. And, and uh, if we can get rapid, um, quick turnaround uh, testing, and, and we have the, the uh, capacity with all of those supply chain elements, chain elements to do it, uh, nothing is off the table uh, for spring. But it might be a good idea to, to just take for a minute and try to understand uh, our, our testing strategy. And we could ask the question about, you know, 1% surveillance testing. Um, and people might know, might not, they, 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 uh, they may spread it without even knowing that they have the results to tell them that they're, they're positive. So perhaps, Carrie, you could, you could tell us um, uh, describe uh, what the purpose of our testing and why, uh, why not more than 1%? Sure. So it's important to recognize that our surveillance testing is really part of an overall testing strategy. And there, was multi, there were multiple layers of testing um, as part of our plan um, to mitigate COVID-19 spread. And each stream of testing really has a distinct purpose. And the purpose of surveillance is really to give us an advance warning of what we're seeing in the community and to give us the ability to estimate the prevalence in the asymptomatic community. It was always designed just to give us an estimate of prevalence. It was never designed as our main testing strategy to actually intervene in the process. We have other testing strategies that was designed more closely with that in mind. Um, and I know Andrew and Matt in a minute are going to talk a little bit more about this, but it's really important to think about the context in which we designed this strategy, which was the summer we were dealing with a very different environment overall than we're dealing with right now. 
And so we are testing 1% of students, and that's at UP and at the Commonwealth campuses, and those are separated, so it's every campus gets 1% of their student body tested every day. Um, we are tracking compliance closely with that um, and making sure that students are complying with that so that we are getting a, as um, accurate of a random sample as possible so that we can make um, accurate inferred um, estimates based on those numbers. Um, and then we're also testing 1% of employees. Um, Penn State, in a very short time frame, has built an infrastructure that includes the complete public health infrastructure that includes medical services for individuals with symptoms, isolation and quarantine space, robust contact tracing, walk-up testing, and surveillance testing programs. And now that we have that infrastructure in, the, in place, we're in a position where we really can look ahead and say, now how can we build these up and expand upon these? Because we have that basic infrastructure in place, which just didn't exist um, a few months ago. So, um, Matt and or Andrew, would, would you like to add, add to that discussion? As, um, Matt and I were very heavily involved in the formation of that strategy in late July. And uh, the, I want to just reiterate what uh, Kara said about the 1%, that, that was, there was no way we could test everybody twice a week. Uh, the logistics of that, the supply chain issues, that didn't exist. And so even if we, we would have loved to have done that, but it wasn't feasible logistically. So then the issue was, could we get an early warning system? Could we get eyes on this thing, reliable eyes on this thing that would give leadership the ability to make off-ramp decisions if need be? And there, 1% is, we persuaded ourselves that 1% was a very good set of eyes, and that's in the order of 500 tests a day. So uh, five days a week, that's a lot of tests that you can estimate the prevalence and look for changes in prevalence. So that's what that was about. And so obviously going into spring, we're in a whole different world with new technologies, different supply chains, much cheaper tests available. Many, many other things are possible. Matt, did you want to add anything more? Yeah, I just, I, again, I just want to reiterate that, that uh, I actually think that, the, that our focus on the 1% number is, um, is, is really sort of underselling uh, the whole system that was built. And I think Kara got to this, is that the truth of the matter is, is that we're testing between almost you know between 900 uh, 800 and a thousand students every day only that, that we're talking about one percent that comes through our surveillance program but we also have uhs and we have our walk-up testing available and we have other uh, other programs available at, at our commonwealth campuses right so we're actually testing quite a bit more than the one percent that that is, that has been the number that's been sort of the focus of a lot of this Right. So, um, uh, so I think that again, the, the, the purpose is to have all of these various layers, the, the UHS and the walk up testing has allowed us to do to do much more targeted and focused testing. Right. And the fact that the that the positivity rates are higher there means that we're actually discovering more cases uh, and getting those individuals into medical consultation. Uh, getting them into isolation and, and starting the contact tracing process, right? So that, that th these are these are all then the important secondary consequences that testing triggers to prevent other things, right? Testing detects individuals that have already been infected, and it's those other processes afterwards that allow a testing program to be part of a holistic process for preventing other people from getting infected. Um, I'd also it, argue that I'd also argue, of course, that the wastewater is catching any student that's pooping in the system. So anywhere in town, anywhere on campus, <laughs> we are sampling them. So we have our eyes on the overall dynamics. Right. Right. Exactly. And it's the the, the whole point of this, right, is to is to look for is to is to look from many sides and to and to to really try and. Um, overcome the, the biases that are inherent in any single one of these ways of looking at things, right? And again, uh, as uh, uh, you know, I think Kara made the excellent point and uh, uh, that, that, that we, set, we built this system several months ago and the world has changed dramatically since then and will continue to change in the months, in the months ahead. And so we're, what we're really looking to do now is to build on those systems and build up the scale uh, and build up, you know, scale and speed and, and ease of use for everybody that's involved. Well, I, I very much appreciate having all three of you, you weigh in be, because really it is all of these different layers uh, that have different purposes um, and, and different characteristics that I think is giving us this, um, um, th this much broader look, whether it's eyes on for the future or, or making sure that 
that we're, we're pulling people that, that are symptomatic or high contact into either uh, isolation or, or quarantine. I know we have just a couple of minutes left, but there, there are a couple of uh, general questions that, that we, we might get in here before we close. And one of those is, is uh, uh, what was a, a common topic about what happens when a virus sits on a surface. And, uh, you know, can it change surfaces um, uh, to, to move from clothing or a mask or, or somewhere else? Um, is there such a tendency to transfer the virus from surfaces to surfaces? So, I, I, well, I think this is, a, this is, again, this is one of those areas where um, the world has changed and our understanding has, has changed dramatically from the beginning of this pandemic to, to where we are now. Um, uh, so absolutely, the virus can get on surfaces. There's been uh, a, a whole variety of research in both real-world settings and and really constrained uh, laboratory settings to look at the residence time of, of, of the virus. And under specific settings, this thing can last for quite a while on surfaces, right? From a practical perspective, however, what we've learned is that um, our initial concerns that surface contamination was was a primary route of transmission, which was where many of us were in in uh, that's where much of the thinking was in March. Right? We've now learned that in fact um, airborne transmission through respiratory droplets and 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 fine respiratory particles that might that might hang in the air for a little bit and then drop out. Right? That actually seems to be the 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 more predominant source of transmission. And, and this is and then this has now caused a shift in the way that we look at mitigation strategies, right? We're focusing much more on masking now to prevent that from happening in the first place. That also prevents those droplets from landing on surfaces. So it does it does uh, it does double duty there, right? But it's also caused us to to focus on um, uh, looking at our behavior in this sort of holistic way, where we're trying to. Uh, minimize the number of close interactions we have with with folks for long periods of time. Trying to move many more of our activities outside, right? So our ch our shifting understanding of the biology of this virus and the relative um, risks associated with with different routes of transmission and, and different different behaviors, right, is continuing to shift the way that we respond to this. And I think it's really important that we keep an open mind. Uh, to that changing understanding, so that we can, so that we can, um, you know, react as new information uh, changes. So I'm, 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 I'm certain that we'll learn new things over the coming months, and that will, uh, and that will lead to to changes in our in our priorities as we go forward. Okay, so so before I close, uh, one last one on on our on our uh, uh, dashboard, we're now talking about people that age off the system. And what does that mean? Is that just a time since they tested positive? Um, yeah, that that that's basically exactly <laughs> what it is, right? I mean, the the, the CDC has provided uh, basic guidance for uh, for isolation and quarantine, and um, and after somebody tests positive, then they should, then then we expect them to be in isolation for uh, for ten days, which is um, about an on average time period from from uh, till when we expect that they would no longer be infectious, right? And so that's what we're doing now is we're looking we're we're counting ten days back from or ten days forward from from every individual that tests positive, and then we're taking them out of what we consider to be the active uh, the active infection pool from that point forward. Ten Thanks. days isn't going to be exact for everybody. Though some people will be a little bit faster and some people take a little, little bit longer, but on average, it seems to be a pretty good uh, a pretty good marker. Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate that. Well, I do appreciate everyone joining us uh, again. Uh, as promised, we said we would focus on on testing and the and the numbers that are provided in in the dashboard. I hope that was uh, useful. I'm just going to close to sneak in one more uh, answer to a question. We have been asked about whether we'll require uh, students and employees to get vaccinated. Um, this this is certainly. Uh, a premature issue. We don't have a vaccine at, at the current time, uh, and and uh, it's not clear exactly what the path is. And uh, the bet of of the experts is that um, when a vaccine is available, and and there starts to be a reasonable number of doses available, 
that the first uh, the first population to to receive it will be those um, who who are at greater risk, and and so this is probably not an issue for us to be thinking about in terms of university policy uh, going into the spring. Again, thank you so much for listening and uh, and so much for your questions. And uh, I will look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks. Bye. Uh, thank you, Dr. Barron. Thank you to our panel of faculty experts. Uh, just a reminder, this is the third in the series of sessions with Dr. Barron. And our next one will be on October 29th. Uh, please look for an announcement on Penn State News and Penn State Today in the coming days with details. Thank you. Have a good evening.